Okay, so we're about to start the event. Uh, this is right before everyone's coming, so I just want to show you a little bit the hall, what's going on. Here we have Tote Shechista. Hi, Tote Shechista, thank you for everything. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Amen, 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 amen. So here's our wonderful area. Okay. Sushi's on its way, as, are the, as is the rabbi, the, the speaker, and the people. Got some snacks ready. Okay, we're ready to start this evening. Say hi ladies, guys. Everyone say hello, hello. <laughs> welcome, welcome. All right, we're getting the event underway. Rabbi's gonna be speaking soon. All right. You wanna make sure it's hooked up? Can you... you see me? Uh, yeah, no, because I think you might have to move it. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's why. Because we moved it. No worries. Sorry about that. Trying our best. <laughs> okay. So we're about to start. We're just testing to make sure our voices work okay. Yes. Best uh, music music, music uh, technology person, I guess. But I don't know what to call you, but you know what I mean. Best, best, best. Perfect. Good? Okay. All right. We're ready to start, everyone? Okay. Marina, please. Come inside, come inside, because we, we, we need the, the koach of Marine to be in our, in our midst. Okay, five, four, three, two. Guys, if anyone has a problem being on camera, let us know in case you, okay. Five, three, okay. And action. Okay. So guys, we're very excited today. We have a big zechut. We have a very big honor. First of all, thank you everyone for coming. But the big honor we have is we have Rabbi Dr. Jack Cohen, who's going to come join us. And he's going to give us the, the opportunity to ask any questions on anyone's mind uh, about dating. OK, no holds barred, but keep it kosher. And uh, we're just going to you know, leave the forum open for any people that have any questions. If not, I'll ask questions. The rabbi has some questions. And I'm, and I'm going to come introduce the rabbi right now. Rabbi Chavod. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm honored to be here. I'm especially happy that it's a small group because it's quaint and it's, it's nice. I can take call, I speak my mind. Sometimes I have to be more politically correct. And so I, definitely next week, next week I'll be in Israel and I have, I kid you not, eight events every night, including two Shabbatons, major. I'm going to be a guest speaker at the Great Synagogue in Jerusalem from Yom Yushalayim. But I want to share with you some of the experiences that I'm seeing. Perhaps you can appreciate what I do by just telling you my background. I was born in Cairo, Egypt, to a family that came, the father came from Syria via Yerushalayim to Cairo, Sephardic. My mother's family came from Odessa, Ukraine, and ran away from the Bolshevik Revolution. And so Sephardi made an Ashkenazi, and they made three of us. <laughs> anyway, after the Six Day War, we were lucky to get, get out alive, Baruch Hashem. If the Six Day was very dangerous. We came to New York. From New York, we were warmly greeted and accepted by the Sephardic community in Brooklyn. I went to school locally. It's good. Yeah. I went to school in Brooklyn, one of the local yeshivot, Achiezer, which is right there. From there, it was Yeshiva University High School, followed by NYU and Harvard undergraduate school, college for uh, pre-med and then NYU Medical School for Sports Medicine and Surgery, where I was a, a doctor for the Olympic Games in 1984, one of the students that was assigned to it. Along the way, in 1974, when I was living in this Sephardic community in Brooklyn, one of the great rabbis or stars, probably in the top five of the greatest rabbis in the world of the last 100 years, decided to pick himself up from a black area called East Flatbush and put himself right in the middle of Ocean Parkway in Avenue West. That would be Rabbi Evigdor Miller. Rabbi Evigdor Miller was probably number three or number four in the world. I got to meet him when I was 12 years old 
he would become my rabbi for the rest of my life. If you don't know who he is, I don't know what rock you're hiding under, because every week, 75,000 pamphlets go throughout the world to almost every country to discuss his commentary in the parashah of the week. When he passed away, I had a little lull in my, I was a physician. Um, it was a little lull in my life, but not too long, because you need a Rebbe. Without a Rebbe, you don't have direction. You need a rabbi, you need a mentor. And one of the questions that I ask girls who come to me, I get a lot of girls coming to me, from all, to all types. I deal with everybody. Married, not married, religious, not religious, Hasidic, Temani, Syrian, Ashkenaz, Ukrainian, you name it. Does the guy that you're dating have a mentor? Does he have a rabbi? Why is that important? It's extremely important. Because if the marriage has a problem, you go to the man and he fixes the problem. He does it quietly. He does it intelligently. The last thing you want is to get your parents involved. Once your parents are involved, it's horrible. Because they're never going to love the, the son-in-law or daughter-in-law as much as they should. So it's very important. Anyway, these rabbis groomed me. And second one that came into my life when I was in Israel and I was at the Western Wall, the Kotel, in 2006, someone gives me a book and he says, read this. It's called The Garden of Imunah. Ladies and gentlemen, I could not put that book down. I have since read that book 14 times in my life. It's not just a book, it's a game changer about how it affects you. And when I deal with people that are not religious, as I start to help them in marriage, I say, you gotta read this book. You need a GPS to life. You need to understand why you had a flat tire, why this, child, this family had a child that was born with special needs, why this person passed away in a car accident. The questions of life that eat away at you, that you can't seem to, to deal with, you can get answers in that book. So anyway, that man who wrote the book was Abshalom Arush. He himself was an Israeli person of Moroccan heritage who had five of his friends die in the IDF. He was a medic in the IDF. And five of his friends passed away one day in a, air, a, a helicopter accident. And he started to question, what's life about? What's it all about? Why are we here? He would go on to write a book that I think today has sold more copies than the Bible. In the millions upon millions in 15 languages. I would join him in Ukraine, in Oman, I think 12 Rosh Hashanahs in a row, just to be with him. We've been there four or five years, but the point is, again, these two people mentored me. And along the way, I decided that I had had enough of getting up at four in the morning or five in the morning to go to hospitals. I didn't want that anymore in my life. I wanted to be able to make a living one to eight, one to seven, nine to 12, I wanted to do my own thing. For me, that was to learn Torah and to teach it. So I, with his encouragement, Rabbi Mill's encouragement, I learned for many years, took classes, then he said to me, get out of here, it's time for you to teach. And so I did, through many yeshivot in Brooklyn, many boys coming home from Israel, you know how it goes in the yeshivot of Brooklyn, whether it's co-ed or not co-ed, you're highly encouraged to take a gap year and go to Israel. If you haven't done it in your life, it doesn't make a difference how old you are. I would encourage you strongly. I've had many clients leave in their 30s and 40s and just spend three, four, five months in Israel. Get to know yourself. Get to know who you are. Get to know what you're about. And so as these boys and girls would come home from their gap years, the boys obviously going to yeshiva, the girls going to seminary, many of them came to my classes, asked me questions about the boys or girls that they were dating. I was clueless at the time. I, it wasn't my skill. My skill was to go in and do operations on ankles and feet. What did I know about that? Well, I started to read book after book after book. And quickly, I found myself under five chuppas, 10, 100, 200, 300, 500, 1,000, 1,200, more. And then creating my own itinerary. And then from that itinerary, I gave my own classes. So one day, I'm, we used to have a class in a yeshiva, 10 minutes away from here, Wednesday night, called Wednesday night dating with Dr. Jack. Not so different than this. Obviously, it was only boys. Um, and there was, we would have buffet dinner. I created a class, and I gave the class on dating. And one person came in, says, I represent Torah anytime. I didn't even know who that was. Can we, we heard you're good. Can we go ahead and tape you? I said, go ahead. This is going back now eight years. Three days later, I'm getting emails from all over the world. 
all over the world. I have problems in my relationship. I need your help. And then I said, I said, God, I think I know where you're sending me now. And that led to a dating, coaching, second career, and lecturing and doing. It is a, not an easy assignment, but it's one of the most fulfilling assignments in the world to be able to build a Jewish home for people. And so I love what I do. And throughout the day, I'm on Zooms and WhatsApps literally throughout the world. Today was Mexico City, was LA, was Miami, was a bunch. So today, I'm just going to share with you some of the questions that I've been asked over the years. Pipe in, by the way, and ask any question you want. Attack me, and I'm happy to hear it, and I'm happy to hear what you have to say. And along the way, let's have fun with it a little bit. Let me start with a small story about appreciating someone's potential. <clears throat> the Baal Tshuva movement, what does that mean? The Baal Tshuva, the return to Judaism movement began about 40 years ago across the world. In France, in Paris, was a woman who herself was interested in marrying a person who would sit and learn Torah. She was going to be a CPA. At, she was going to go to the University at the Sorbonne, which is a very famous university in Paris. And she came up with the idea, I will become a CPA. I will make the household panasa, the living, and my husband will learn. Together we split the merit of him learning Torah, which is an incredibly amazing merit. So she tells her father, Dad, I am ready to date for marriage. She's about 21 years old. And he says to his brother, do you see anybody in synagogue that might be a suitable match for my daughter? Her name is Esther. Fine. She's smart and she wants someone in learning. He doesn't understand what that word means. They make up that there's going to be a blind date in a five-star hotel in Paris and they're going to meet in the lobby. They've never seen each other. Okay. So she's sitting there all proper, decked out, beautiful dress, makeup, the whole nine yards. And just and as an aside, it's so important. I, God forbid, I don't mean to uh, focus on, on the girls in the room, but it's important to wear makeup. I've had to tell three girls in the last 24 hours, why are you not wearing makeup? It's very important. It's important to be put together. Anyway, so she's all put together, and a guy approaches her with a Grateful Dead t-shirt and cut-up jeans. Are you Esther? She says, who are you? What can I do for you? Are you, are you like the parking attendant? He says, no, I'm your date. The girl turns white as a ghost. What are you talking about? You don't even look religious. You don't even have a keeper on. Oh, I'm so sorry. Goes to the back of his pocket, pulls out one of those keepers, puts it on. Is this okay? <laughs> so they sit down and she's like, she wants to kill her father. What's he thinking? And he's sitting down, he says to her, so tell me, what are you looking for? She says, I want to work and become an accountant and I want my husband to learn Torah as long as possible and we'll share that merit. He looks at her very innocently and he says to her, why would you want that? I'm going to be an architect. I'm finishing my master's in six months at the University of Paris. And they're now fighting about what are the right goals to have in life and what direction. And he's telling her, you know what you're talking about. It's wrong what you're pursuing, etc. After an hour, she gets up and she says, are you done? Can I go now? Enough with your speech. He looks at her. And he says to her, what if I became that guy? Would you be interested in me? She looks at him, not in a million years could you ever become that guy. Okay, she goes home, she tells her father, she lets him have it, you wasted my time, what a total loser, a total loser, what's it all about? He goes and he tells his brother, you made such problems for me, my daughter and I, not talking now. All right, they made up. Three weeks later, the uncle calls the father. He goes, he wants another date with her. He dropped out of college and he went to yeshiva in uh, Aix-le-Bain. Aix-le-Bain is a yeshiva. On the, on the, it's on the border of Switzerland and Paris. It was started by one of the Chafetz Chaim's Talmidim who ran away from the Holocaust. I've been there. It's a beautiful yeshiva. And he'd like to see her in the same hotel. So they make up for the second date. It's three weeks later. And our friend walks in with a velvet kippah, blue shirt, nice trousers, pants, and he's sitting down and he says to her, I took your advice. I decided to go to yeshiva and learn. 
and I'm loving it. Inspiration, I feel like I'm living for something. I have values, I have a goal in my life. I'm, in a, I'm working on my midot. You know, Judaism is, is an accountable religion. It doesn't allow you just to sit and vegetate. You gotta be growing in Judaism. That's what it's about. How do we know? Very simple. Every 30 days, we have Rosh Chodesh. The moon comes and goes. That's a time to take a accounting of how am I doing. Every seven days, we have Shabbat. I sit, I rest, I enjoy the food. I don't work. I don't put the cell phone on. I think about how my day week was and where am I going with my life, right? Every year, we have Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. What's the story? Take an accounting. How was my year? What's it all about? I start to take an accounting of my life and think about it. And now the conversation is really flowing. And they're really enjoying themselves. After two hours of endless conversation, it's time to go. He says to her, magic question, can I have another date with you? She's thinking about it. She says, no. No! He's really broken. Because he thought he made the move. Right? He made the change. Anyway, she goes home. She's not sure if she did the right thing. But she's, she's comfortable with her decision. His name was Yosef, by the way. Yosef Levy. Anyway, word gets back to her that Yosef left Paris to go to Muncie, New York, where he's studying in Yeshivat Or Sameach. Today it's called Torah's David. There are two major yeshivas in the world, Or Sameach and Eshat Torah, that are responsible to produce most of the people that come back to Judaism. If you've been to Israel, right there by the Kotel is Eshat Torah's main campus, started by Ranoa Weinberg. Right? So anyway, he's there. And, and now, the years are rolling by. Our maiden, she's no longer 21. She's now 24, 26, 28. She's starting to get older now. And the word gets back when she's 29 that Yosef went on to Israel. He joined the yeshiva. He got married. They saw that he was a superstar. He got a, a, a financier to bankroll him, built a building. Yosef now is dean to 300 students. Rosh Yeshiva. Look how he climbed from zero. He has a magnificent building in Jerusalem, 300 students. He got married. And she's thinking, boy, did I blow it. I had an opportunity. I didn't really see it. It was in front of me. And he has rolled by and rolled by. She's now 38 years old, 17 years later. And word comes back, because we really all can identify with this, that there was a terrorist attack in Israel. And he had had five kids with this wife. The wife and the three kids were killed in a bus bombing. And uh, she felt so bad. And now, after 30 days, he's coming back to Paris in order to be able to take, to take shiva calls from from relatives that were related to him. And everyone's talking in Paris. He's coming back. Do you want a date with him? And she's thinking, I better not blow it this time. So, same place, same hotel. And she's waiting. And in comes through the front door, a man looks like an angel. Hamburg, you know what a Hamburg hat is? That is reserved only for Rosh Yeshivot, for deans. Like a big, big hat with a frock. That means a long coat up to the knee. That's only top stuff. He walks in, black and white, looks like an angel. She's like in shock. This is the guy with the Grateful Dead t-shirt and the cut-up jeans. And he sits down and they start talking about how life just progressed. And he says to her, it's all because of you. You changed my life. My wife used to go to the Kotel every Sunday, take two buses to pray for you. Because if not for you, I would never would have married her. You made me to what I am. She starts to cry. And she says, I had mercy. You had mercy on me. I never had mercy on you. Four dates later, they're engaged to be married. On the day of their wedding, he says to her, I'd like to give you a souvenir. He pulls out the first kippah he ever wore. And he goes, put this in our photo album. And they had two kids. So it's about, you know, there's a lot, there's so many lessons to be learned from here. 
we live in a very superficial world. We live in a very superficial world. We live in a very wealthy society. And much of what we, mistakes that we make is because we don't scratch deep enough to see what the Midot are all about. I'll tell you a story. A woman by the name of Gila Mandelson took a birthright trip. She's today one of the biggest dating mentors in Israel. She came from California in jeans. I'm sorry, looking just like you, okay? And no, nothing wrong with it, it's fine. And someone takes her, takes her, and I used to be like that, don't worry. Yeah, um, takes her to a wedding in, in Jerusalem and t says to her, an orthodox wedding. And explains to her what it's like and the mechitza. And she says, what a ridiculous life. Why would people want this? But it, it eats away at her. And she says to her, mentor, can I stay? I'd rather, I heard about Neve Yerushalayim, which is the girl's version of of uh, Esha Torah. And there she stays for four or five months. She starts to keep Shabbat, Mitzvot, etc. You know, the clothing changes, everything. And now, it's time, she's about to get engaged to a student in Esha Torah. It's time to meet the rabbi who's the dean because the boy that she's going out with says to her, I can't get engaged to you unless my rabbi approves of you, which is great. And it's one of the world's greatest celebrities or personalities, Noah Weinberg. He was a star. He started Isha Torah. Anyway, she walks in. And she's confident with herself. And he sits down with her. She says, an imposing rabbinical figure is sitting behind a, a, a desk. He says, how are you? What's doing? Where school did you go to? UCLA. So nice. What did you study? What was your major? Psychology. Fantastic. And they're rolling. And she says in her, she writes in her diary, I'm just... I know I'm doing well here. And now he hits her. He hits her with the magic question. Kila, my dear, can you tell me what's your definition of love? What's love? And she says, well, I'm doing so well so far. I figured I can win this one. So she says, Rabbi, love is the feeling that you have when you feel like you have that feeling. And she says to herself, boy, did I blow it. I can't even define what love is. Love is not a feeling. Because love is a feeling. Love is, feelings are fickle. They're here today and gone tomorrow. And if you're going to base your decision on a feeling, it can lead you to a miserable human being, an abuser, or someone who's just totally wrong for you. So she started to do her own research. Well, Yahoo, you're liking this, right? Because now you're making computations of your first marriage. Right? Okay, good. what Rabbi said about love. Right. So... Love can't be a feeling, she says to herself. So what is, what is love? What, she says, what should I be looking for? Besides physical attraction, I want to make a point, a point here. You must be physically attracted to the person that you're going out. I am not in any way diminishing that at all. You must. But you have to understand something. Physical attraction is the lobby to the building. Hashem created that for a reason. God created physical attraction for a reason. Why does he want that? Because ultimately, he wants children in the world. The first mitzvah of the Torah, Peru bu melu ta'aretz. Be fruitful and multiply. He wants men to be attracted to women. He wants women to be attracted to men. But that's the lobby. Now you need to take the elevator up the building. And now she says, I figured it out. I need a guy who's loyal. I need a guy who's caring. I need a guy who's honest. I need a guy who has integrity. I need a guy who is spiritually growing. I need a guy who is morally unshakable. Morally unshakable. Vice versa. I was at Sharon Gaines's event last week, speaking to a Bakharian guy. Good looking guy. Put together guy. Right? What happened? My wife decided to become a nurse. She and she started studying with someone in, in, in college. Next thing I know, she's in bed with him. Four kids. Four kids. Now comes the ugly divorce, private investigators. If I tell you this story, you can't make this up. I fear for her life because they caught her red-handed. She walks into the synagogue. She opens the hechal where we keep the Sefer Torah. She tells the rabbi, go ahead and open the perashah that deals with a woman of infidelity. I'm going to read it now. I mean, this woman is taking her life into her hands. She reads it. 
and she's caught again. So I really fear for her if she's going to make it past the year. You know what I'm saying? That is a very scary move to pull off. Anyway, so love, she determined, is what the rabbi told her that day. She said, let me tell you what love is. Love is the, is the attachment that comes between two people because you appreciate the person's goodness in their thoughts and their actions. This guy is good. This woman is good. That means they got your back. You understand? Here, honey, you can have the seat first. Sweetie, I'll pick you up from the subway. No problem, I got you. Go to work, take care of it. It's ishto kegufo. It's his wife is his body. That's Hebrew. His wife is his body. It's one unit. That's what we're looking for. Again, love is the attachment. This is Noah Weinberg. I didn't come up with this. I wish I did. Love is the attachment that comes as a result of appreciating someone else's goodness in their thoughts and their actions. Such a love can make it even when it has tough times. Even every marriage is going to have some low in the action. But such a love in which you based your first decision because you saw something good in their deeds, the kindness, compassionate, goodness, sharing. Now you know you're going somewhere. She says the following. She became a therapist. She lives in Israel. She says, I, had, I once had a couple, Larry and Linda. Larry and Linda were on the same page in everything. They agreed on politics. They agreed on diet. They agreed on food. They agreed on travel. They agreed on music. They were enviable. Everyone was jealous of them. They had such a great marriage, or so they thought. Larry and Linda are now divorced. What happened? They made one mistake. They didn't understand that life is about personal growth. Judaism, if you're practicing it correctly, forces you to grow. It doesn't allow you to remain stagnant. Larry and Linda didn't realize that marriage, listen to what she says, is a spiritual path. If you're going out with someone that's completely disconnected from religion, beware. Marriage is a spiritual path. As a result, self-centeredness took over, leaving Larry only caring about Larry, Linda caring about Linda, and the marriage just basically crumbled. I'll give you an example. I have a Shalom Bayit case in Las Vegas. She became religious at 50. She's a banker. He's a mortgage guy or something like that, something like that. She goes and walks the mile to shul. And sometimes it can get pretty hot in Las Vegas, or over 100 degrees in the summer. He doesn't care. He washes his car, he goes to play tennis, catches up on the latest news, gets into his car 10 minutes before the Kiddush, goes out there and enjoys himself on the cholent and the, and the uh, whiskey, etc. I kid you not, the police are there four times a year. So you need someone who's into growth, into spiritual growth. It's so important. That is the glue that is essential in order to make that marriage work. So now, I'm gonna ask some questions and I'll tell you what I think the answers are. These are questions, I was on a podcast called Headlines. It is run by a guy named David Lichtenstein. David Lichtenstein is a multi-billionaire who owns trophy properties in Manhattan. We're talking about towers. He's also a Talmudic scholar and an absolute genius. He has probably more downloads than anyone in the world called headlines. So every week he attacks a certain area. So I've usually been on his show once a year. And he said to me, come up with some questions that you've been asked and we'll, you know, we'll discuss them. So I'll take them with you. Question number one, how do you advise people who complain that they've been going out with someone for a while and they're not feeling it? You guys, you ever heard that? Girls, you ever felt that? Right? Answer, I'll, I'll explain. So I'm dealing right now with a couple, lovely couple. She is a uh, investment banker at one of the top finance ho houses in Wall Street. She's Moldovian. And he is one of the biggest AI experts in the world at Colombia. He is Brazilian, uh, Polish father and Lebanese mother. Um, five years going out. Right? Now I'm working with them. 
and the answer is to the question is how do I why and they're having issues and here's the here's the answer you're not asking the right questions this is a PDF that I created for that show that I have probably emailed 10,000 times or more to people all over the world these are the most important 100 questions to ask in dating so for a couple that went out five years, you'd think they would have talked about everything. I asked the first 30 questions, maybe they asked two out of 30 to each other. So if you're not asking the right questions, you're definitely not gonna build an attraction. We live, as Robert Miller would say, we live in the world of words. Our life in this world is really all about verbal. Actions are small compared to how much time we spend talking. Would you agree, girls? I think so, right, guys? Exactly. So the questions that you ask will determine if she's for you or not for you. To me, it's absolutely ridiculous that you can go out four months, five months, and six months and tell me you're not sure. I can tell you how to do it in two dates. Maybe even less. Two to three dates. You can get a rough idea if you're with the right person. Why? Well, listen to some of the questions. And they're not... You don't need a PhD to, figure, to put these questions together, but they get to the heart of life. What are some things you're proud of? Yes? What if you're not being fully forthcoming with the questions that you suggest? What if you're not being... I'm not even sending that question. So you mean, you yeah, go ahead. These questions, you're yeah. ask them. Yes. The person you're asking them to, with their answers, they're not being fully forthcoming. Then that's a good question. The answer is you're not going to be magnetically attracted to them. It's the responses that are going to press a button in your heart. So. But there, but there are things like, for example, somebody was sick, maybe a grandfather or a grandmother with something that you yeah. took over and you're not being forthcoming about that. You may need to dig and you find out. And so for that, I would answer you differently. That's, if you date, if you date consistently enough, it's hard for people to fake you out and stay that way. Eventually, you're going to catch a contradiction or inconsistency. Right, but by that point, you invested so much. That's life. When it comes to dating, you invest. You don't know where the end result is. You don't. But if you don't do anything, you don't, you're not going anywhere. That's life is about, life, life's, life's about, I always tell everyone, what does bitachon mean? What does trust in God mean? Trust in God means I make the effort, but I have no hand in the result. You understand? I don't know if I'm going to get that job, but I got to go for the interview. I don't know if I'm going to get that parking spot, but I got to take my car and try. So again, results are not in our hands. Bitachon, trust in God, means he expects me to do something. Pick up the phone and get the order. You understand? Go get food. The person who wrote that famous book, Chovot Levavot, from the 13th century in Spain, wrote like this. You could say, you know what? God, you take care of it. I don't, I'm not going to eat. You'll figure out a way to sustain me. No, you will die if you don't pick up a spoon and eat. So human action is the effort. The results are not in your hands, but you have to get out there and, and, and swing. You never know. Okay, yes? Question. Um, my whole thing that we started here, like, you know, a few months already, is about becoming the right one so that you can find the right one. Love it. So how would you... Um, you know, look at that question and tackle that question of what does it mean to become the right person so that you can attract the right person into your life and build the kind of home you want to build. If you can share that with us. Becoming the right person is having the most balanced life you can possibly have and have a trajectory of growth. For example, I get up, here's my ideal guy, okay? He gets up seven, 7.15. Uh, no shortage of synagogues in Brooklyn now. This is not Wisconsin. He goes to shul. Takes him about an hour. If he has a little time, he goes to the rabbi's class, 15 to 20 minutes. He listens in. Maybe a little parsha of the week. Maybe some lessons of how to behave, become a better person. Maybe some Rashi. Goes to work, 9 to 5. 9 to 6. Goes to the gym for an hour, three times a week. If he's single... Back to the Beit Midrash at night. Another one hour of learning. I mean, somewhere he's figured out dinner. And then, let's say he has a social event one night, he has a date, and he's keeping good friends. He or she are keeping good friends. Friends that are going to help propel you up. Not people that are going to bring you down. That's very important, ladies and gentlemen. Analyze your friends. 
But that's kind of general. So in other words, if I'm going and I'm dating someone. Yes. She's dating, he's dating, whatever. We're dating someone. Yeah. How do we know that this is the right person? We don't. Because, we are, I'll tell you why. You've established for yourself, you've established for yourself an idea of what you want, and I'm going to get into it a little later. You've created and for yourself a list. It's called the top 10 list. I'm happy you asked that question. I'm a very big believer. You sit down with a piece of paper and write down, what are the 10 qualities that I want to see in a person? You only, and then when you date them, you're fishing for six out of 10, just majority. That's it, six out of 10. If that girl or that guy has those qualities and you consistently see them in the dates, the energy is right, you miss her when you don't see her, you call her on a date that you're not with her, that means your heart's with her. Understand? That's how you know. Essentially, you've created a top 10 list, you have an idea of what you want, and she's meshing with you. Love, they say, by the way, I did a very big interview last week at Chabad Young Professionals in their, they have television studios, and I hit them with a line, they love this line. Love is not two people looking at each other. Love is two people looking in the same direction. You heard that? Are we looking in the same direction? If I want five or six kids and you don't want any, we got a problem. You understand? I'll give you an example. I set up a guy to go out and it was, he's a tough cookie for me. Right, he is, he's a high anxiety, he's, I gotta keep an eye on everything with him. I watched at every date, I actually made every date for them. Until he was okay, after 10 dates he was rolling on his own. And then I went to Panama to give a few lectures, I came back, they had gotten engaged. I, I was so scared that this should go well. I forced the engagement to be in my living room. I made my daughter and my granddaughter put up the carpet with the roses. I got the, uh, the bottle of champagne with the stand. Will you I even printed, will you marry me at Ella? Right? So I thought everything's rolling. I went away. I, pro I came back to problems. Why? Because he was hiding in the sand. He wanted... He was like a Baal Tshuva, good boy. Uh, he, he wanted a mechitza in his wedding. He's not that religious, but it meant a lot to him that there would be a mechitza, right? And the girl's parents, who were very traditional Bukharian, weren't going for it. They wanted mixed dancing with everything. So I said to him, X, Y, Z, leave it alone for now. I will deal with this one day before the wedding. I'll get an agreement going. I'll deal with it. But he, had to, he kept nudging. And he wanted a commitment early on. Right? Um, but here was the kicker. He hoped that his kids would go boys school for boys and girls school for girls. And the girl sat with me and says, I never agreed to that. I'm, I'm open to public school. The guy turned white as a ghost. So I said to him, you know, I'm just changing the name. I said, Nathan, he went out with her for six months. You didn't discuss this? It's a basic. How religious do you want to be? What school systems do you want to attend? And the thing just unraveled in front of my eyes. So are you saying that it's not about how you feel with the person alone? It's about asking a lot of questions to really yes. the person very well. Yes. Yes. I, as a doctor, I still maintain my license. So I have dealings with a lawyer in Buffalo. He's one of the top healthcare lawyers in New York State. And he flew in, I'll explain to you, I'll prove it to you. He flew into New York from Buffalo because he had a hearing with the Department of Health in Manhattan. After the hearing, it's back into an Uber, back to JFK to go back on the flight to get JetBlue. He gets to JetBlue, the weather get, turns bad, and it's about seven o'clock at night. And he said to him, you know what? There's been a four hour delay why don't you go over to the TWA airport, right next to the T JetBlue terminal, hang out, have a, have a drink, and we'll call you when it's time to board. Fine. He walks in and he sees the shock of his life. In the lounge in the TWA airport, 100 Orthodox couples on dates. 100. This is a famous place, by the way, for Orthodox dating, TWA hotel. And he calls me up the next day. He goes, what's up with that? What's going on over there? I said, that's real dating going on. What's going on? 
They're asking very targeted questions. They're going out with the girl, and the girl's going out with the guy. They're not there to waste time. They were searching for their life partner. So they're going to ask questions. And they're looking for qualities and character. And I'm going to share. I'm going to continue to ask the question, to, to share these questions with you. These are the kind of people who in three or four dates know if it's going to work or not work. You understand? And he was like, whoa. In my world, he says, we go out three, four years. We live with each other, ba 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 and all that stuff. It basically never goes anywhere. Waste of life. Five, six, eight, nine years. Meaningless nonsense. But this is the way to, work, to date, and this is the proper, this is how to get to the end result quickly. So let's keep going. What makes you happy in life? How have you grown in the last five years? Now imagine the girl asks you that question, Shifta. Well, I've grown, I've gone, I upped it from one class to three classes a week. I finished Misirai Sharim, one of the classic books on, on, Musa, on character development, which was written by an Italian scholar, Moshe Chaim Lutzato. I, I finished Chovot Levavot. I made Siyum on two or three Gemarot. I went to Israel, Project Birthright. No, you, you tell it. You're telling her this. No, oh, the girl, very simple. The girl, a girl to impress me, I want to hear one thing. She's doing voluntary work of chesed. I work with special needs. I help volunteer. I, I deliver um, Shabbat meals to the poor. I want to hear volunteer chesed. I'm not a genius, but where do I get it from? Very simple. Open the Bible. The first shiduch in the world was made by for Avraham. Sent his servant to go find me a wife for my son. What was he searching for? Master's degree from Turo? No. Uh, that she was a CEO of a major company? No. Smart? No. No. Kindness. He made a deal with God. The girl that gets me water and gives my camels and my guys water, that's the one. So if you show me a girl that on her, on her transcript has been doing voluntary work, voluntary and chesed work, whoa, you got my attention. Why? What does that tell me now? She's going to be a great mom. She's a giver. What about the dad? Oh, if he has time to do chesed, kol But it's not, it's not quite It's always good. Chesed is good. Chesed is a part of our being as Jews. I always, I don't like to act, bra you know, brag and act arrogant. But tell me, most of the hospitals of the world are named after us. Mount Sinai and etc. And, Ra and Maimonides and uh, come on. Beth Israel, come on. So we, I mean, can you find another religion in the world that has many lone societies as us? You can borrow baby carriages. You can borrow corsets for a wedding. You could borrow chairs. Whenever we have a, uh, uh, have a party, my wife tells me, go to XYZ. She has 150 chairs in her garage. There's a code in the side. Pull up the garage. Just put it back where you found it. Yeah, this is our being. As being as Jews, that's just in our nature. That's our part of our core. You understand? So if I see a girl, if I see a girl that's doing chesed, which is doing kind acts, I'm I'm in, I'm interested. I'm very interested because now I know what's her. She's a giver. It's not about taking. Although it's okay to take, but okay, you want to ask a question? Right, can we just unpack this with uh, Eliezer and Rivka? Yeah. He ventured out to way for Yitzchak, but his, his approach was rather interesting, rather different, because he stood by the well, which seems to me like where the social areas were people... That was where people congregated. Yeah, That's where Yaakov went for Rachel. Right. Yeah. But he, he remained stoic. He sat. Because it was obvious at the place where people congregated, there's an unfamiliar face. So somebody is going to inquire, and it seems to be Rivka. And what did he see? So uh, back up for a minute, yeah. and I'm, I want to add a very important event. He was feeling really good about himself because the 10-day trip now had cut down to three. So he sees God's with him. And he made a deal with God. Yes. He made a deal with God. He said, the girl that does X, Y, Z, yes, he was a stoic about it, but you know what? You could do that with God. He said, if you're doing a mitzvah, if you're doing a good act, you could put God in the corner and say, I need a sign if this is right for me. You understand? Right. Yes. Just to point out that it's not as simple as it seems. It's a lot more body language, not body language, but a One more time? Yeah. Meaning it doesn't seem like it's 
seemed, it's seemingly simple. We don't care about the family. We care about her. Right. You understand? She did what she's supposed to do. They lured him in to kill him. Right. You understand? The idea was to give him poison food and knock him off. But Hashem did a miracle and flipped the food and it ended up being eaten by her father and he kicked the bucket. They lured him in to kill him. That was the whole idea. But she passed the test and she, he put down a test and she passed it. By the way, there are times in life God's going to give you a very clear sign. I'm going to tell you a story that just absolutely blew me away. I was in shul this morning. I go to the Landau's shul. What I like about that shul is that there's 61 minyanim a day from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. So I, I'm no early bird. I get up at 7, but I, I pray at 9.30. That's my minyan every day. I like to read quietly. I like to take the half hour walk to shul and talk to God on the way. I do my gratitude session. I'm a huge believer in gratitude session every day with God. Gratitude opens the doors to anything you want in life. I'm telling you right now. Gratitude is key. Thank you for my life, my health, my wife, my children. My, I went to the bathroom. That's, that's considered big stuff. Thank you for my money, my house, my apartment, my car, my vacation, etc. And a guy says to me, Rabbi, I got to share an incredible story with you. You know, it's always a test. It's always a huge test for everyone here, especially if, you go, if you're men and you go to synagogue. Should I take the phone in with me or not? You know, many synagogues have cute cubbies now in the lobby. So you can don't, not take your phone in so you don't disrupt people. He goes, and he's a very successful healthcare guy. He sells healthcare. He sells all types of healthcare, uh, you know, materials and supplies. I never heard a story like this. So he says, you know what? For a good while, I was good. I wasn't doing business before praying. Because you're not supposed to do it. We all fall victim to that. Answer an email uh, to work, the buyer, etc. Now, he had happened to have gotten a huge opportunity. A guy wanted to buy a lot of stuff from him. And he was interested in gauze. Goes right, so he take he decides he's doing it da, 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 and he's he's gonna nail this deal. He decides to take a shower. He has, he has an apartment, and the the shower doors not always uh, where he's renting the apartment are not so sturdy. He pulls a little too hard. Two tempered uh, uh, glass doors come shattering on him. You know, explosion. He should have been killed on the spot. He's standing in a rubble of glass. The maid hears what's going on and she calls Hatsala. Now he has little cuts here and there, right? They sort of have to pick him up in a, in a, in a um, they said, you want, we have to take you to the hospital. No, it's okay. It was an absolute miracle, right? He had to, he says, that day before shul, he decided, you know, he's going to go. And he has to put something in the garbage. He opens the garbage can and there was a wrapper, four by four gauze. And he goes, God was talking to me. I tried to make the deal for three, four hundred thousand dollars on gauze. He said, don't do that again. Sometimes God will send you a clear sign. Sometimes, most of them not. But anyway, so, I got, now, how have you grown and changed in the past five years? What are you doing currently to maintain your spiritual growth? For a guy, I spoke about it. For a girl, maybe two minutes of prayer a day, maybe one or two psalms, tehillim, that kind of thing. Describe a challenge you faced in life and how it made you a better person. Uh, I survived COVID. My mother died from cancer. I didn't, I didn't buckle in, God forbid. All, all of us have challenges. I want to know... If you had a challenge, how you faced it. Why? Because now I see if you've got the character to deal with life's challenges. Life is going to throw all types of challenges at you. I want to know what you're made of. Who's your best friend? How long have you known him? How long have you known her? What quality do you look for in a friend? They're all here. And by the way, anyone who needs it, just shoot me a WhatsApp and I'll send it to you. 305-206-1916 is my cell phone. And if anyone needs it, I'll give it to you again. And I'll shoot me a WhatsApp and I'll send you the, the, the list. Um, what career field would you like to enter? Do you enjoy your job? And that's important. Where would you like to live? This becomes a problem when I've, certain communities, the girls don't want to move in the United States. They're stuck. Will he come to me? 
is the question. Will he come to me? I get it all the time in certain communities. And I say to them, you know, that's not the halacha. That's not the law. I'll whip out a Manus Friedman article. He's a genius. And he writes there. He says, there was a couple standing in front of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who I happen to have had the pleasure to know very well. And he said, they were arguing about getting engaged. And she was demanding that he should live in her city. And he says, he says, he tells, a, he tells the man, he tells the woman to walk outside and he says, it's not for you. She's already putting up demands of where she wants to live. Everyone knows that the law is you go where the guy's livelihood is. So that's important. Again, do you have a Rebbe you're close to? That's a question a girl would ask a guy or a mentor, but I also like to hear if a girl has a mentor that she goes to. Who influences her? What's your best quality? Oh, you might say it's arrogant. No, it's not. Rivik Dimila always told us, when you're dating, sell. Sell yourself. What are you about? Don't be shy. If you accomplished, if you got promoted, if you did well in school, you got a good sale, let the other person know. It's okay. Dating is about selling yourself. Do you consider yourself to be a happy person? That's a very important question. Watch how they answer that question. I deal with a lot of divorced people. No one told me he suffered from depression. No one told me she suffered from depression. Until I got married and was too late. We have a high divorce rate today. 60%, maybe a little bit more, because people are not doing due diligence in the dating process. They're hiding their heads under the sand. They're not asking these questions. If they did, I can tell you now, we would cut that rate down at least 80%. Do you feel yourself getting angry often? That's a big one for the girls to look out for. Rav Shalom Arush, who wrote the Garden of Emunah, taught me a principle. There are three things that absolutely are musts that a girl needs to look out for and to be careful. And I'll tell them to you in Hebrew and I'll tell them to you in English. Look out and check to see if the guy has the following. Ka'as, kamtan, kaptan. Ka'as, does he have a tendency to be angry? I mean, it's okay to lose your cool once in a while, but is there a constant repetitive episode where he blows his temper? Ka'as. Kamtan, is he cheap? I had a case where a guy took a girl in 90 degree weather under the Brooklyn Bridge for two hours and even offered her a bottle of water. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bad thing. And yeah, and three, Kapdan. Is he firm on having it his way all the time? Comes the word Makpid, my way or the highway. So you want to look for these things. It's important. And how do I do that? So I always tell people, Rotate what you do for a date. Why? It can't be just all about going out for food. You want an interactive date once. You want a, uh, a lounge. You want a dinner. You want paint and sip. Let's go for pottery, shuffleboard, board games. Get to see them from different vantage points. You never know what makes them tick. It might be one date that opens things up. Sometimes there's a lot of traffic, I'm not sure, or not. and then you get them at a certain point where they just open up. So try different date venues. How do you resolve a difficult decision? Who do you turn to for advice? When, a girl told, when, when I deal with a girl who's 24 years old and I ask her, who do you turn to for an important advice? And she tells me, my 23-year-old girlfriend, that's sad. It's very sad. What the heck does she know? What does a 23-year-old girl know? I want her to tell me, I have a 45-year-old mentor, Rebbitson, 50, 55. When someone, I, I just, I had that last week with a woman who called me from the other side of the country to talk to her daughter who's here, right? And she said to me, I said to her, who do you turn to for advice? Oh, my friends. And you could tell right away, people who have that kind of twisted ideology doesn't go very far. The mother's on top of the daughter. Come on, she's 34 years old. She's not getting married already. Rabbi, you know, stay on top of it. I said, I will. 
I get three, two or three text messages from the girl. No, I don't have time. I don't want to go forward with it. Her loss, it's fine. The point is, when you have someone who's got this crooked ideology, it affects them, and they go on and waste more years of their life. Okay. Um, how do you spend Shabbat? Oh, I want to hear that. What do you do? Describe to me your Shabbat table of the future. And if I hear something like, oh, my husband and I, my wife and I are sitting at a beautiful table, freshly ma manicured wife, kids squeaky clean from clean showers, my husband went to synagogue, and she cooked for him a nice meal. Wow, I'm hearing what I want to hear. You understand? Uh, versus, well, you know, we get up at 11 o'clock, we go to the mall, come back. That's not what I'm looking for. You get it all, by the way. Give me a second. Oh, who do you most admire? Who's your role model? I got to tell you an amazing story. There was a guy who was a Torah student, a uh, yeshiva boy, 23, getting, about to get married, when he suddenly discovered, when he suddenly developed, I'm sorry, a, a sort of bad rash or acne on his face, and two weeks later is his wedding. The mother is like frightened. What are we gonna do? What's gonna be with the pictures, the day of the wedding? She asks her friends. They recommend this top dermatologist on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. He'll fix it. So the boy walks in, pretty packed waiting room, sits down, and they're processing patients, and suddenly some punk rock star with yellow and pink hair walks in. And everyone's going to everyone, like, ah, oh, look who walked in. Look who walked in. They're all admiring her, asking for an autograph. When, it, like, when the guy nudged him, the guy sitting next to him, look who walked in. I don't know who she is. And then they start circulating a rumor in the waiting room. Did you get this greenhorn? He doesn't know who she is. Look how primitive he is. You know, like they say in Hebrew, primitivi. Look how primitive he doesn't even know. The word gets back to the nurses that the guy doesn't know who this famous rock star is. And it gets back to the doctor. Well, unfortunately, he's a Jewish guy, but he's not religious. Did you hear about this primitive orthodox guy? He doesn't know who this... Finally, it's his turn to be seen and examined by the doctor. So I hear you're getting married, the doctor says, yeah. Probably one of those orthodox matchmaker type things. Yeah. You people, you're just not with the times. Why don't you become modern already? Get with the ways of the world. This kid was not stupid. This is Dr. Schwartz. Let me ask you a question. How many times, how many times have you been married? He says to him, five. He says to him, sir, you have nothing to teach me. Have a nice day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Who is he going to teach? Us? He had five failed marriages? We know what we're doing. So we talked about Shabbat. How do you deal with a disagreement? Let's say you disagree. How do you deal with a disagreement? Do you just walk out, march out of the room? Some people do that. Or do you sit down and say, let's find a compromise? Marriage is a business, a not-for-profit business. And it's all about coming to compromises, a lot. And there's more, but I, you know, I gave you a, a good gist. Go ahead. Uh, assuming it's a logistic conversation yeah. as far as the dealing with the agreement, because if there's a personal status, then it's not a logistic conversation anymore. Person should leave. I'm not understanding you. So you mean you're getting responses that are not acceptable? Uh, as far as dealing with the disagreement, assuming it's a logistic conversation, then yeah, to sit and to talk would be the solution. But if there's personal stabs and jabs, and of course not. That that's a toxic relationship already. Absolutely, sure. Yes. Yeah. By the way, I have. I have given you guys a lot of material to chew on. Anybody have any questions on anything? Don't be shy. Yeah. It's not an Go ahead. Hit, hit, hit. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. 
So a question on that, and I'm not throwing anybody else under the bus because you guys are all my brothers, you guys are all my sisters, but I would assume that does she dress modestly if she prays once a day? Is that a requirement of one should have or not at all? Or let it grow with the time, with the passing of time? Everyone is made up of a different um, makeup. makeup, and a good thank you for the word, and a different constituency. Like this one is 30% that, 20% this. It depends on where she's headed. As you talk to her, do you see movement in, in this direction? You understand? Tell her, you know what, down the road, I would love it if my wife would cover her hair and wear skirts. Why? Because, first of all, let me tell you something. I was, years ago, maybe six, seven years ago, I was mentoring a Ukrainian model. I mean, this woman was stunning. And she was a bala tshuva, she became religious. And we're talking about tzini'ut, modesty. And I was giving her a lesson on this. And I said to her, don't think they're staring at you because you're good looking. They have one idea in mind. That's what they're thinking about. That's what men are thinking about. Okay? Uh, wait, let me just finish. And how you dress defines how people look at you and what they're thinking. So she says to me, Rabbi, you're absolutely right. In my old club days, if I dressed very revealing, a certain type of guy walked up to me. Then when I changed it, and I then became more modest, a whole different kind of character, caliber guy came to me much more elegant, much more refined. It's all about, it's what, how you dress will attract what comes to you. You agree? Thousand percent. And she, said, and she seconded it. I was teaching it, she said, Rabbi, from my life's experience, this is absolutely correct. So, tiniut is in, let me, let me just, tiniut is in, tiniut is in, is critical. I would give the, the girl a chance if she's interested and it's on her, it's on her, her monitor going forward because it's just going to make her life better. Go ahead. Please, anyone else? This is the time to ask. This is a multi-part question, but this is what we're saying before. What's the number one ingredient, firstly, that you can't compromise on in the alien in a marriage? Like, for example, you know, the Syrian, the Syrian the Syri world, white hat and black hat, right? Let's say you come from a black hat community. Yeah, yeah. That community, your family is that. Let's say the girl is white hat, and she comes from them, they're very, very stubborn on that. Mixed wedding, not coming here. I don't care about that. I care about what she's thinking and what you're thinking, and if both of you agreed that you want to go in a certain direction. I don't care about what the family, what the black hat family thinks and what the white hat family thinks. I care about the 10 or 15 or 20 dates you've gone on and you've discussed the kind of life you want to live together. At the end of the day, you're going to bed with her, not her, not them. Absolutely. So if you're fine, I don't all that stuff. Yeah. But she feels... What? Differences yeah. ...are an issue. And then you also go... The what? She feels that background differences... Are an issue? Are an issue. That's her problem. If she can't, if that's her hang up and she can't get over it, you gotta move on. You can't force anyone into a relationship. She has to want it. She has to be willing to fight for it. Many couples, I had that in my own marriage, in a sin, where we had to overcome certain family things, but my wife was headed in the right direction. She was actually more religious than me, which is, by the way, what I tell every guy. Date up religiously. Always take a, guy, a girl better than you, because the girl, controls the home. In Hebrew, we call the Ekeret Habayi. She's the foundation of the home. She's going to get that guy out of bed and get him to shul. But you can't pull a girl up. You also spoke about high anxiety. Yeah. High anxiety. One side has it. Let's say the girl has high anxiety. Yeah. The boy doesn't know what the word anxiety means. Is that a problem? Is that... If the girl suffers from anxiety <laughs> and the guy doesn't, does it bother him? It depends on his personality. If the guy is, you know, robot, supercharged, he's not going to be able to handle her. He need a guy who's very tolerant to deal with a, a girl who has anxiety. I have that right now. Right now I'm dealing with this case in Miami where I have a girl who has fantastic midot, but she's got anxiety and depression. There was a, there was a Yom Etzma'ut event 
over the weekend. The guy came to pick her up. She's in bed. She didn't get out of bed for two days. The father was on the phone with me today. It, it, how much could you tolerate? He's worried that the, the boyfriend's going to pick up and disappear because how much can he handle that? So, you know, we're trying to get the right mix of medications and at the same time, you know, therapy. It's okay to have an issue in life. It's okay to have an emotional condition. It's okay to have a medical condition. I speak as a doctor now. As long as it's being managed. The problem is when people ignore it and don't get the proper help. That's the problem. They refuse to take the meds. They don't take the meds consistently. They don't go for help. That's the problem. In your experience, this is the number one factor that's not compatible, that can happen? There's no such thing. It's all subjective. There's no one quality. Each community has different things. The Persians have their quirks, the Bukharians have their quirks, the Syrians have their quirks, the, Bukha the uh, Ukrainians have their quirks. Uh, it depends. I don't mean, I mean in general. There is no general thing. Person, person. There isn't. Some people, you know what? It, every one of us have different tolerance. If I itch you on your hand, some, of them, some people are strong, it doesn't bother them. Others are very dainty. They can't handle little things. It's, it's a case-by-case -case basis to, the, to tell you that there's one quality that the whole world would accept. Yeah, she's not Jewish. He's not Jewish. That's about the only one that I can think of. Every one of us is built and, and, and assembled and wired differently. So, can't. Anything else? Go. You actually answered one uh, of my questions during the response to him. Uh, so the difference between a guy being more religious and the girl being uh, much less religious? Or Big problem. Vice, vice versa? Yeah. That um, I have seen a lot of uh, uh, marriages there where the guy was more religious yeah. and the girl was not. And he tried pushing and pushing her. And at one point she said, just stop it, I had enough. It's a huge problem. Uh, the other way around, I've seen some marriages fail, but it works out more in right. favor of, of, of uh, right. religion. Okay, I'm happy. No, I know. I, it's time tested. I'm doing this 30 years. The girl, if the girl's better than the guy spiritually, it's looking really good. But not a lot. Can't have too much of a disparity. Right. But she's a few degrees higher, she'll pull him up. But good luck trying to pull a girl up if you're more religious than her. It's not happening. The first thing will be on the same level, but after all, they did reduce. What's that? They should be on the same level. Yeah. But after all, they do different things. That's the after Yeah. Now that's a problem, depending on your community. No, but that's a problem. Uh, do you want to walk in, let's say you come from a black hat, you want to walk into a wedding and your wife's got stuffed all the way down? I don't think so. I don't think so. You're going to have, that's a very big social crisis you have on your hands. What? She dresses modestly and then what? I would bend for that. Yeah. If you see that down the road she's headed in the right direction. But definitely have her checked out by someone like me. I sit with a lot of couples that are dating and to see if they're made, met, met, made for each other or not. Get a third party uh, um, um, opinion on that. With someone like me, me or someone like me, but someone who really spends a lot of time in dating. They would, I know this stuff, I can figure it out in 10 minutes. Yeah. Why do you think people are so anxious and depressed today? Because you mentioned that, and I think that that's something that needs to be addressed. There's a lot of people today that are suffering from anxiety, depression, you know, because I'm a life coach, I do a lot of people, and I see that it's a big issue. So why would you say that today is so high? Life pressures, to some extent. Well, life yeah, I know. You know, before, in the past. Today we have it better than ever in history. Right. We really look at it objectively right. and honestly. Oh, we've never had it better. No. In terms of so materialism. Today people suffer anxiety. Yeah. Zero. So, what would you say? What, what, how would you... I, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't want to mislead you. I, I would guess... Well, I mean, hey, what do you have to say? I, I would guess that it's because people are a lot weaker. And... I know what I want to tell you. But then you might tell me, you might come back to me with an answer. My, my, my initial gut instinct would be that if, a, that if a person spends five or ten minutes every day or every other day on imunah, faith in God, they'll be more immune or immunized 
to anxiety. But even in... But, but you're going to tell me, but there are religious people that have anxiety. Wait, 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 wait. High. So, so many kids that from the best families, the best everything, and they're having... So it's a, it's a big phenomenon. It's not just by the non... You know, I can't, I'll tell you what it is. Overall. I don't feel bad that I can't answer that question because it's not my specialty. No, 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 no. What have you heard? No, no, I, I feel that... What? What are your thoughts? People are... A lot Hold on, more. that's a general statement. What? Then let's, 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 let's trace that comment. Why are they weaker? Why are they weaker? Yeah, because keep going because, with that. Because good times create weak people. And then weak people create bad time. And then bad time. It's like whole cycle. So it's like. You're like saying because happens. we're wealthy, but that's yeah, actually yeah, to our it's detriment. Like that. It's that's like it. the littlest thing and they break down. Yeah, they're friends. They were like able to go through. So, you, so you're, answer, you're answering your own question. Right. question. Right. Essentially, it's not that because they're wealthy. You know, because we're wealthy, we have problems. How do you know it's worse now than it was a generation ago? I don't know. It's proven. It's proven. Can I comment? That people of course you can comment. Is this a victim problem? It's a victim problem. Oh, oh, people play the victim. <laughs> Could be. Guys, who else has questions? Ladies, please. We need some from the ladies because all the guys are hijacking the questions. Questions. Does that have anything? No one's judging. My pleasure. We're good? Okay, I gotta go pray. We have 10 guys, by the way? I think so. You wanna make me up our beat? I'll be the Hazan? So I'll help you guys lead. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. So, thank you so much, Rabbi, for having us. And I want to say to every one of you, okay, if you could just give me like two minutes, was it the same? guys, just two minutes. I want to say to every one of you, you know, right now we're living in a very difficult time, but we're also living in a very wonderful time. And I think it's so important that we awaken the best part of ourselves and that we really focus on how we can grow. And that's what the rabbi was saying, that we need to be happy by growth, and growth is life. So I give a brachat to everybody that we should keep growing, keep living, and always remember to shift on and to be happy. God bless. Thank you. Okay, can you just, uh, thanks. And thank you so much.